I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for including me. And I'll preface my comments by pointing out that this is kind of a broad topic. And so instead of giving my usual sort of data-driven investigator type of lecture, I'm going to instead try to string together a series of concepts and take findings not only from my own group, but from the literature to kind of cobble together a picture that I hope will be helpful to you uh, in understanding this important question. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the story begins with a physiological process termed energy homeostasis that matches energy intake to energy expenditure over long time intervals to promote the stability of body fuel stored in the form of fat. So you might begin by saying, why would we have an energy homeostasis system? From an evolutionary point of view, how did that come to be? And when I address that question, I like to cite the quote uh, from my colleague, Bruce Spiegelman at Dana-Farber Cancer Research Institute in Boston. And he said that, whereas insufficient fat storage is maladaptive during times of famine, excessive fat storage makes an animal both slow and highly palatable, a very bad combination for survival. So the, the larger point here is that there was uh, pressures, evolutionary selection pressures, both to have enough fat mass to survive, but also not to have too much. And over the past 70 years or so, this depiction has emerged as the leading way of understanding how energy homeostasis works. This model was originally proposed by Gordon Kennedy and has since been developed and tested by many investigators, including our own laboratory. And the way that it works is that we know that there are neurocircuits in the brain that when activated can affect both feeding calories consumed as well as energy expenditure calories out. In other words, influencing the energy balance equation. And we know that energy balance over time is the main determinant of how much fuel is going to be stored as body fat. So to connect the body fat storage to the brain control system, we need some kind of an afferent signal that the brain can use to inform it as to the status of body fat stores. And leptin has emerged over the past 20 plus years as the candidate mediator of this effect, although there are probably multiple signals that the brain is using simultaneously to gauge this afferent information. As a consequence of this arrangement, depletion of body fuel stores is sensed by the brain, triggering activation of neural circuits that stimulate food intake while also reducing metabolic rate. Now, I'm not gonna be talking about the metabolic rate today, just the food intake piece of this response. But the resultant state of positive energy balance is typically maintained until lost weight has been regained regardless of whether one starts out lean or obese. So in other words, obesity is a condition characterized by the biological defense of an elevated level of body fat mass. And we can see that in this data, set of data that came from a meta-analysis of a series of different studies that looked at very low calorie diet weight loss in human subjects. And what we're looking at is the percent of the initial weight loss that has been regained as a function of time after the diet intervention is completed. And you can see that after one year, roughly one third of the weight is recovered. After two years, more than half of it has been recovered. By five years, about 80% has been recovered. And additional studies suggest that if you got to 10 years, pretty much 100% or 95% of that initial weight uh, will have been regained. So we have evidence that this system is operative and that it's limiting the effect efficacy of obesity treatment. But can we point to specific neurocircuits that are both engaged by weight loss and capable of driving feeding behavior? So that's what I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about. Now, most energy homeostasis neurocircuits are situated in the hypothalamus, which is shown here on this slide. And if you look in a rodent brain, and of course, most of our work is done in rodents 
uh, the corresponding area is here. And if you take a slice along here and look at it in the coronal plane, now you're looking at an image like this. Hippocampus here and cerebral cortex above, and this is the hypothalamus. And I want to focus specifically on an area known as the arcuate nucleus, which is shown here adjacent to the third ventricle. And if you blow that up in a cartoon illustration, there are many neurons in this area involved in food intake control. But the ones I want to focus on are those that comprise the melanocortin system. So the melanocortin system is comprised of two sets of neurons in the arcuate nucleus, the AGRP neuron and the POMC neuron and the downstream targets that they project to that express the receptor known as the melanocortin-4 receptor. And the activity, the interaction between these two neurons at this receptor site is an important determinant of the balance between food intake and energy expenditure. So let's take a closer look at how that works. The AGRP neurons actually contain three different types of uh, peptides or transmitters that they release. One of them is AGRP, which I mentioned, which acts at the melanocortin-4 receptor. There's also NPY, which is co-expressed with AGRP and activates NPY receptors. And there's also the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA that acts on GABA receptors. And basically any of these three or each of them, when occurring in the hypothalamus, are capable of increasing food intake. Now, the effect of AGRP at the melanocortin-4 receptor is offset by the effect of alpha-MSH, which is released from POMC neurons. So alpha-MSH acting at this receptor is a ligand. This is a, a GS-coupled uh, receptor. And when you activate the melanocortin-4 receptor through alpha-MSH, you increase cyclic AMP signaling in the target cell. AGRP, on the other hand, basically blocks alpha-MSH and also reduces constitutive activity of this receptor because it's what's known as an inverse agonist. But what I really want to focus on now is a huge amount of data that has been published on AGRP neurons over the years showing that activation of these neurons has a singularly powerful effect to drive hunger. It not only motivates eating, it basically redirects the animal's attention to the finding and consuming of food. So we can see evidence of this here. This is simply uh, the consequence of activating AGRP neurons using a method known as pharmacogenetics, which I won't go into, but I can assure you that the, me the method here results only in a very cell type specific activation of AGRP neurons. And when you look at the food intake, in normal mice, you can see that it's increased by several fold over a four hour period when you activate these neurons. And this is true uh, both in the fed state and in the fasted state and in some disease states as well. Now you would expect that if you activate AGRP neurons, you're going to see an increase of body weight. And that's what you see. Body weight actually shifts dramatically as compared to the control mice. Uh, and it peaks out here. And you might say, well, I just said earlier that there's this energy homeostasis system that promotes stability in the amount of body fuel stored as fat. So you would expect that if you were to increase body weight through this type of intervention and then release the animal from the intervention, if what I said to you is correct about the energy homeostasis system, the body weight should rapidly return to the control level. And so what happens when you end this experiment? And by the way, this was done by Michael Crashes when he was working with Brad Lowell a decade ago. And sure enough, when you release the animal from this activation of AGRP neurons, the animals rapidly return to baseline body weight. What about when you inhibit the neurons? That's actually a question of greater physiological relevance because if you see an effect on food intake arising as a consequence of inhibiting the neurons, that tells you that the activity of those neurons was required for the normal feeding behavior. And when you take normal mice or fasted mice and you inhibit the neurons, you can see here that you get about a 50% reduction of intake. This is from the same Michael Crash's paper over a four hour period. 
But it's not just under those conditions. There are many conditions under which feeding is normally increased in a way that seems to depend on AGRP neuron activation. So you can see that, for example, with exercise-induced feeding uh, published last year. And so in this figure, the black is the normal intake. These two blue and green lines are what happens when animals are exercising. And the red line is what happens when they're exercising, but you silence the AGRP neurons. And you basically block the effect of exercise to increase food intake when you silence AGRP neurons. Similarly, when you move an animal from a room temperature environment to a cool or cold environment, their food intake goes up because they need more calories being consumed in order to offset the increase of thermogenesis that keeps the animal at normal body temperature. And uh, Jennifer Deem from our research program in Seattle published just recently this finding that the effect of cold exposure to stimulate feeding is dependent on AGRP neuron activation. So what I can say is if you look at the data above is at room temperature, the data below is cooler, 14 degrees centigrade. The data in black are the spontaneous food intake measures, which you can see go up when you go to this colder temperature. But in the colored lines, you can see that when you inhibit AGRP neurons, you don't see any increase of food intake in association with cold exposure. So, okay, potent effects on feeding required for normal feeding responses. How are these responses mediated? Well, this is a, a nice illustration provided by uh, Jennifer Deem and Greg Morton, my partner of many years in Seattle, in a article or review article that was just recently accepted for publication. And on the top panel, you can see all the different places where AGRP neurons project to, and I'm not gonna go through them all, the point that I want to make here is that the projections to areas highlighted in green are ones that's, that when you activate those specific projections, you get increased food intake, okay? That's not surprising. But look at all the other things that AGRP neurons do in order to promote feeding. When, when you project, activate the projections to the periventricular thalamus, you not only stimulate feeding, you enhance the response to odors related to food. When you stimulate the projection out here to the parabrachial nucleus, you mitigate or inhibit uh, signals of pain or malaise or sickness that might otherwise interfere with feeding. Down in the bottom, when you activate this area uh, shown in blue, this tends to suppress social engagement. And when you activate this area shown in the scarlet color, this suppresses reproductive and maternal behaviors. So basically what you're doing when you activate these neurons is not only motivating the animal to eat, but distracting it or preventing it from engaging in a lot of other behaviors that it would normally engage in. I'll conclude this little bit of the talk by pointing out that Richard Palmiter, also at the University of Washington and a long-term colleague I reported 15 years ago that experimental ablation of AGRP neurons causes near complete food intake suppression lasting for seven to 10 days in mice. And he, after many years of dogged effort, he was able to show that this is specifically because of the loss of inhibitory tone to the parabrachial nucleus. When you destroy the AGRP neurons, you remove GABAergic inhibition of these, this brain area and you activate neurons that cause malaise and anorexia. Okay, what about the regulation of these neurons? Well, there are different types of regulation operating over different time scales. Consistent with our negative feedback control of energy homeostasis, there are feedback control systems. So leptin secreted in proportion of body fat mass, insulin secreted in response to recent meals, the rise of blood sugar, also secreted in response to the degree of body fat mass. Both provide inhibitory tone to AGRP neurons. Glucose appears to as well, although it kind of depends on which AGRP neuron you're looking at. On the other hand, if you haven't eaten for a while, an empty stomach is associated with release of ghrelin, which activates these AGRP neurons. So there's this feedback control, feedback in relation to the body's nutritional state. 
But at the same time, there is what we would call feed forward or anticipatory control of AGRP neurons that acts very rapidly, simply in response to the perception of food without actually having consumed it or changing body fuel stores. So simply the sight of food, the smell of food, the taste of food, these signals are sufficient to completely silence AGRP neurons in a fasted animal. In other words, the goal of the neuron activation is to get you to where you found the food and you're ready to eat it, and then the job is done. Also, nutrients in the gut activate uh, hormonal responses, including CCK, uh, that feed back to provide inhibition of these AGRP neurons as well. So to summarize, AGRP neuron activity is high in the absence of inhibitory input. And the inhibitory input is constrained, is provided by three tiers of nutrient-related signals that act on different timescales. There is the rapid timescale, which is the simple perception of food, an intermediate timescale, which involves nutrients in the GI tract, and a slow timescale, which involves signals in proportion to body fuel stores. Fasting eliminates or reduces each of these sources of inhibitory input and therefore potently activates AGRP neurons. And in fact, I'm sort of dating myself here, but we were the first ones to show this back in 1998. What we're looking at here is in situ hybridization uh, to detect AGRP messenger RNA in the arcuate nucleus of a fed mouse and a fasted mouse. As I mentioned earlier, the ability of fasting to stimulate feeding also depends on this AGRP neuron activation. So now I'm going to return to the question I raised at the beginning of the talk. In fact, the title of the presentation, what can weight loss driven feeding behavior tell us about obesity pathogenesis? Well, I want to reiterate a couple of points I made earlier. So I, I would be the last one to say that we understand how obesity occurs. What I would say about it is that there are many factors that can promote a state of positive energy balance that leads to weight gain and increased fat mass. But the key additional point that many people don't really realize is that obesity pathogenesis also involves a resetting of the biologically defended level of body fat stores. In other words, the increased fat mass in obese individuals is being actively defended in much the same way as it is in lean individuals. Well, how does that occur? What, what's going on? We don't know all the answers, but a, I would say the leading model for understanding this is shown here, where somehow this afferent negative feedback input that is reporting to the brain the status of body fuel stores is not getting through properly. It, there's a, a problem with how it's being generated, how it's being transported to the brain, how the circuits are sensing and responding to that input. And the larger point is that if this signal, this leptin or other signals is not being conveyed properly, then you would need more fat mass to generate more signal in order to generate what would amount to what the brain perceives as a normal signal. So what happens is you dampen the response here of the brain to this input, and you, as a consequence, end up defending an elevated level of body fat mass. So what is the evidence that hypothalamic dysfunction actually contributes to obesity pathogenesis? Well, I wanna to return to the AGRP neuron, uh, and this is why I focused on it before, not that this is the be all and end all to explain obesity pathogenesis, but it shows you the trail of breadcrumbs that we're following to begin to get answers to these questions. And there was a paper just last year from Lisa Butler working in Zach Knight's lab at UCSF showing that in a mouse model of diet-induced obesity, which is probably the most common animal model of human obesity that is used in the lab, diet-induced obesity sharply blunts the responsiveness of AGRP neurons to the inhibitory input that I discussed a moment ago. I'll just show you some data from their paper. This is fiber photometry data recording in real time in living, conscious, behaving animals uh, calcium currents uh, reflecting neuron activity, specifically of AGRP neurons. And so what you can see here is that 
under baseline normal conditions, when the animal even just sees or smells the chow, as I mentioned earlier, you get this rapid and steep silencing of AGRP neurons. But if the animals have diet-induced obesity, resulting from six weeks of high-fat diet consumption, now, when they are confronted with the same food presentation, the silencing of the neurons is blunted by about 80%. So in other words, the in normal inhibitory control of these neurons is not working properly. And it's also true if you put nutrients in the gut. So if you put intragastric lipid, you can see at baseline, this is a powerful inhibitor of AGRP neuron activity over time, and that animals with diet-induced obesity the response is blunted by at least 50%. So why does this matter? Well, we actually don't know the significance of this finding, but certainly in my mind, blunted inhibition of AGRP neurons in response to nutrient-related cues may contribute to the defense of an elevated level of body fat mass in obesity. Well, that then raises another question. Is diet-induced obesity associated with pathology in the arcuate nucleus that might blunt AGRP neuron responsiveness? And now we're going to go back a few years to work that started in my lab and then was taken over by Josh Thaler, who at that time was training with me and has been picked up by other labs around the world. And we're looking at, again, this area, the arcuate nucleus, and we're looking at the effect of consuming a high-fat diet as compared to consuming standard chow, and we're looking at the response of two different glial cell types, microglia, which are sort of immune surveillance glial cells, and astrocytes, which serve many different functions. But the key point here is that in response to any kind of neural injury or damage, both the microglia and the astrocytes are activated. So the question is, does that happen in response to a high-fat diet that's going to cause obesity. So in green here are microglia, and you can see their kind of spidery appearance. And within seven days of switching to a high-fat diet, there are many more microglia, and they're much bigger, and their processes are coarser and more elaborate. So that's a microgliosis in the same area where AGRP neurons are located. And if you look at astrocytes, by staining for GFAP, you see pretty much the same thing. So taking this a step further, Josh Thaler and also a group at UCSF both published that in mice, hypothalamic gliosis is both necessary and sufficient for excessive weight gain during high-fat diet feeding. Well, moving to the human situation, my colleague Ellen Schur and now many others around the world have adapted a structural MRI method to look at hypothalamic gliosis in humans. And they have published several studies showing that obese humans do have micro, uh, hypothalamic gliosis. It's the same in children. And they have recently shown that in obese women with type 2 diabetes who have bariatric surgery, there appears to be some improvement in their hypothalamic gliosis. So to summarize this part of the talk, in both mice and humans, obesity is associated with pathology in the same hypothalamic area where AGRP neurons are located. And in mice, this gliosis response contributes to obesity pathogenesis. But whether the gliosis contributes to or drives AGRP neuron unresponsiveness to inhibitory cues in obesity awaits further study. I just want to make a little bit of a shift before I wrap up here, and that is to point out that the hypothalamic gliosis in humans and in animal models is associated not only uh, with obesity, but with type 2 diabetes. And this is some data that has not been published yet. It's under review at Diabetes Care, and Ellen Schur was nice enough to allow me to present them to you today. And what we see here are three groups of human subjects based on their glucose tolerance test shown here, the normal subjects, impaired glucose tolerance, and type 2 diabetes. And these in the middle are the plasma insulin levels and the C-peptide levels on the right. And down here in the bottom left is the schema for how structural MRI is used to identify areas in which gliosis occurs. 
and that signal can be quantified as the T2 relaxation time. And in these studies, they did the T2 relaxation time in four different brain areas, the medial basal hypothalamus, amygdala, white matter, and in the putamen. And the point is that if you look at progressively deteriorating glucose control, there is a stepwise increase in this signal corresponding to hypothalamic gliosis. But it's only in the medial basal hypothalamus, not in these other brain areas. And if you do a correlation analysis, as is in this paper, you can see that whereas there is no correlation between any of these parameters with these other three brain areas, if you look at the relationship between the gliosis signal and fasting glucose, you can see there is a significant positive relationship. The same if you look at the glycosylated hemoglobin, the same if you look at the area under the glucose curve, and conversely, insulin action as measured by the disposition index, which is the product of insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity, is inversely related to the degree of hypothalamic gliosis. And Martin Myers and I and others in our lab have been saying now for a while that we think that the mechanisms involved in energy homeostasis in the brain overlap with the circuits involved in glucose homeostasis by the brain. And in fact, Martin Myers and I recently published this review article where we try to make the argument that since they are components of the same system, uh, we should refer to the system not as the energy homeostasis system, but maybe the fuel homeostasis system, since it's talking about both stored for fuel and circulating fuel. And we hypothesize further that a shared central defect like gliosis can contribute to the defense of both elevated circulating fuel, that is glucose, and stored fuel levels, that is adipose triglyceride. In other words, both type 2 and obesity. Consequently, the brain can, in theory, be targeted therapeutically to ameliorate hyperglycemia and type 2. And I'll just show you this uh, work. I'm not going to get into it because it's been published for a number of years. But we uh, showed that in rodent models of type 2, a single intracerebral ventricular injection of fibroblast growth factor 1 can effectively reset the blood glucose level to normal for weeks or even months. So wrapping up, I would argue that defense of elevated body fat mass is fundamental to obesity pathogenesis, and it is the explanation for why weight loss triggers an adaptive increase of food in intake that drives weight recovery, which represents a major obstacle to effective obesity therapy. But we still have much to do. We need to connect the dots. How are gliosis and aberrant AGRP neuron regulation linked? How important are these particular processes to the defense of elevated body weight, not only in animals, but in humans? And what I presented to you is actually a gross oversimplification. There are many different neurocircuits and their regulation and their activities all are woven together. And we need to know much more about how these things work and what goes wrong in obesity. But the more we learn about the neurobiology underlying the behavioral response that drives recovery of lost weight, the greater the potential to develop effective strategies for sustaining therapeutic weight loss. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging the National Institutes of Health, which has supported my program for many years. And some of the work that I didn't show you focused on FGF1 has been supported uh, generously by Novo Nordisk over a period of five years or so. I'd like to also point out some of the folks who did the work that I shared with you today. We have a very large and active and highly competent group. In particular, I want to single out Greg Morton, uh, Jared Scarlett, and Josh Thaler, as well as Zayman Mazada and Tuna Paris, who have been important faculty colleagues and collaborators for many years. And on that note, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.